Thank you again. Well, uh, do you enjoy the conference so far? Yeah? Great. So before we come to the next talk, we have some questions as we just um, announced. And uh, which one is the first question? Uh, we had questions on the conference opening. Oh, yeah. uh, the first one was, will there be a coding session? As far as I know, not an official one. But if you like to have one, feel free to ask someone from the core team. And uh, we, I think we are able to organize this. And uh, the second question was, will you show both speaker sessions live in different live streams? And as far as I know, yeah. there are two there different... There are two live streams. Um, it's a bit late, I think. The uh, question came from uh, Switzerland, and uh, I think they might have found it already. <laughs> and afterwards, we had two questions from the keynote. Yeah. Who allowed you to publish a photo of my defenseless, drunk self? This is easy to answer. You didn't have a red dot in your face, so that we knew you wouldn't want to be photographed. And uh, the second one was, why sponsoring rates are so odd, like 2,083 euro? Uh, this is just because of value-added tax, because we, th this is something we give to, um, we, we don't keep, and that's why it's a bit weird. So that was it. That was it. And now? Next talk up. This is uh, Yannick Ritchie. Uh, from Switzerland. From Switzerland. Joining us. He's from the Contao community. Yes. I got to know him uh, last year when he was member of the NEOS Award jury. And now he's live on stage here talking about what he did to make Composer memory efficient and fast because he really worked on that pretty much. I read his blog post. I'm looking forward to his talk. Me too. And give it up for Yannick. No, now. Wow, what an introduction. Um, I didn't expect to get an introduction like that, so I actually prepared the first slide uh, to introduce myself, which I normally don't do because I guess you're not interested in my person, but in the story I'm about to tell. But as my story is somewhat related to the story I'm about to tell, I thought I would introduce me a little bit. Um, so, yeah, that's all you know already. So, uh, I do PHP stuff mainly. And uh, I'm one of the currently eight core developers uh, in the Contao CMS, and, um, which is one of the reasons I am here today. And yeah, as you've already heard, Stefan mentioned that I was um, part of the uh, NEOS Award jury last year. So this is not my first encounter with your community, and I was actually uh, part of the first uh, online edition two years ago, which was a lot of fun. So here I am again. Um, I do love to talk about a lot of stuff. So unfortunately, today I will have to leave early because we are actually having a Contao bar camp in Potsdam. Um, so I get like full-blown conference experience after three years, which is great. Uh, so this will have to wait for another time. So why me? So why am I on stage today? It's actually quite fitting that I'm talking about efficiency because the people that have uh, listened to the talk before uh, know that we have to talk about uh, efficiency and you know using up less RAM and uh, runtime and everything. So it's actually great. So whoever did the schedule, well done. Um, so why me? Um, that is actually a real project, a Contao project, where I ran Composer Update. Um, it used, that's Composer 1, the latest version. It uses like three and a half gigabytes of RAM and run, runs almost one and a half minutes. So why was that a problem for me? So back in 2014 or something, uh, yeah, something like that, my story started because we decided we wanted to release Contao 4 and we decided we wanted to make Composer a first-class citizen. 
So unlike many other CMS, which you might probably know, where Composer is kind of, you know, this sidekick thing where you can sort of install plugins with Composer, but also not, we decided we don't want to have this. We wanted to have dependency management with Composer and only Composer. And that was a problem because people in our community back then were very acquainted with the kind of default way, uh, early days, you know, zip archive, uploading it to the server, running some kind of installation wizard, you know the deal. You, we've all been there. And um, that's kind of a problem if you want to run a Composer update on the web server. So we came up with, first of all, we had to build a solution for people who did not really like the command line, still don't to this day, and uh, for whatever reason. Um, and we built the Contao Manager that's kind of a separate uh, project which builds or provides a graphical user interface to Composer. And then I built kind of a service, a cloud service that where you basically send the Composer JSON and some platform information and it does the resolving and sends back a Composer lock so that the heavy loading process was outsourced into the cloud. And that worked and still works. And so the problem was actually solved. However, oh, excuse me, that I found that quite intriguing. Like why would the software need three and a half gigabytes of RAM growing, and why would it take 90 seconds to run, right? It would still annoy me, um, even on my local computer. RAM was not an issue, but I still had to wait for one and a half minutes. So, the long story started. Um, this is one slide. It's just a slide, but this slide took me like five years to realize. So, the problem behind the memory usage are the number of rules. And we'll get to what rules are in a minute. But that is the problem. And I spent nights, and days, and weeks figuring out you know, micro-optimizations here and there, getting acquainted with the Composer internals. And I failed. I failed again. I failed over and over again, because that's what we do in programming, right? So the rules are the problem. And this number here, you cannot really read that very well, but it's 5.6 million rules, and those are PHP objects. And now, if you just take a few bytes per rule object, that will basically end up in three and a half gigabytes of RAM. So, the rules are the problem, and that's why we're going to focus on them for the rest of the talk. So, Composer is a dependency manager, package manager. It's a dime in a dozen. It's the best one out there, by the way. Just wanted to say that. <laughs> uh, for all the people that are applauding, I guess they had their experiences with, you know, Yarn and NPM and other stuff, maybe. So Composer's main task, it does a lot of stuff, but its main task is to find a a compatible solution of all the packages in your dependency tree, right? And so that only one version of every single package is installed in the end, because that's how PHP works. There's no way, well, yeah, there's no official way as to how you can run the same class with the same namespace with two different versions, right? You can do class alias and, you know, different autoloaders, but don't. Um, this is, in mathematics, we call this Boolean satisfiability problem. Now, this is just, it's a very complex name to say either it's solvable, true, or it's not, false. So there are two outcomes, that's why it's called Boolean satisfiability problem. Very fancy name for a very simple problem, which it is actually not, because there is uh, a problem that is solved, it's a problem that's solved with a so-called SAT solver. SAT stands for satisfiability. Now, Composer uses one of these SAT solvers, and if you might not have known it, that's uh, based on OpenSUSE's LibSIP, so just as a side note. Now, a SAT solver 
mostly operates on the conjunctive normal form. And now you sit in your chairs and you go like, what? What is he even talking about? You know, it's I didn't come here for a math lesson, right? And basically, um, that's one big and statement that consists of or statements. And yeah, now you still sit in your chair and you, what is he talking about? So I brought you an example. Um, so basically, it's, it looks like this. So A or B and C or B or C, uh, A or B or C and A or not B or not C and so on. So you have these uh, or statements and they're all connected with one big and statement. Um, in mathematical notation, this would look like this. So maybe you remember something, you know, from school with this funny not notation and stuff, and maybe you don't, it's fine. I didn't either, so. Um, yeah, the letters is what we call literals, and every uh, bracket, every or statement uh, chain we call a clause. Um, and the question a SAT solver tries to answer is, what assignments do we need for the literal? So what value does A have to take, or B, or C, in order to have this whole AND statement resolve to true? If there is a solution, then there it would resolve to true. If there's not, false. And in our case, those literals are the packages, right? The versions. So we can find out which ones are compatible to each other. And we're going to look at that in a bit uh, more detail right now. There are actually annual competitions about SAT solving. So this is not just PHP doing some fancy stuff. SAT solving is a real problem. It's also used in AI and everywhere. And I think this year's logic conference is in Israel with thousands of students and professors, so if you fancy this stuff, go online and uh, join. <laughs> so the SAT solver is all about pizza slices. Of course it's not, but I figured I would bring some pizza examples because that's usually easier to understand than if I were to talk about package A, package B, package C. So we're gonna use pizza examples from here on. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if you're hungry, but... That's it. So I hope you can see this in the back. That's basically your composer JSON stripped down to the bare minimum. So you have a name, which is the pizza margarita in our case, and that has two requirements. It requires uh, toppings mozzarella and toppings fresh basil in some kind of constraint, right? Yeah. And what happens in the SAT solver is composer creates these literals for every single version, right? So your root project is always assigned version one. Um, so we get this A here. Let's say that's literal A. I chose colors in order for you to see which ones belong to which ones, and also letters, because I don't know if there are people that are colorblind. So B would be the toppings mozzarella in version three, C would be 310. Then we have uh, the fresh basil in version 2, and we have the fresh basil in version 201. So notice that every single version gets a literal assigned, right? And then what Composer does is it builds exactly these rules or clauses. So now we already know that this is what we were talking about before, where the problem uh, lies, right? But we'll see more in detail later on. But what happens is exactly this. So I will also put it in PHP notation a bit more so that uh, if these funny signs are not your thing, then maybe this one works better. So this translates, a requirement translates to either do not install the whole pizza margarita at all, or if you do, either install toppings mozzarella in version 3, or 3.1.0, and again, either do not install the whole pizza at all, or if you do, then version 2 or 2.01 of Fresh Basil. That is basically all that happens in Composer, right? Now, a bit more terminology, so for the next slides. Um, so we have the solver, that's a class in Composer that represents the SAT solver. That's 
like the heart of Composer. Then we have a package. And for you, a package is probably the name in different versions. In the internals of Composer, a package always means a concrete combination of one specific version and the name. So Neos Flow version 1 is one package. Neos Flow version 101 is a package, right? Um, I hope this existed. I'm sorry if it did not. Um, the rules are our problem. We have way too many rules. And the rules are basically what we've seen before, right? This is these OR clauses. Then we have uh, the repository. You should be familiar with that. So you have packages org. If you use private packages, well done. Then you use packages.com or your own GitHub or whatever VCS service. This is uh, responsible to provide all the packages, the information about the packages. And then we have something that's called pool. That's the collection of all the packages we use to then build the rules and resolve. Um, could also be named package collection. It's not. Its name is pool. So I was going to show you some of the code examples, but I figured it would take way too long if I did. So I'm just going to tell you the major design issues in Composer 1. So one of the main issues, architectural design issues, was that there was no clear separation between the pool, so the the whole uh, set of packages, and the rules, so the SAT solver rules that were built for it. Um, so what happened is basically it looked at your composer JSON and it said, oh, OK, mozzarella. Then it asked all the repositories and said, OK, what versions do you have for mozzarella? So packages, right? And then it would build the SAT solver rules for it. Up next is fresh basil. And then it would again ask the repository, give me all the packages you have for fresh basil, and then build the rules. So it kind of tried to do some smart stuff with lazy loading rules. And it was basically all in vain, because at the end of the day, it needed all of it anyway. Um, and that just limited us in applying. We couldn't apply any optimizations, because two things were done at the same time. And as we all know, separation of concern and stuff, so that was a problem. And the second problem was that it loaded all the versions of a package that existed into memory. So I picked Symfony Console because you might be familiar with this one, as I've seen it's also used in Neos. And if you look at it, it currently has like 550 tags, so 550 versions that exist, and Composer, if you require, whatever you required, Symfony Console, whatever constraint, it loaded all the 550 packages into RAM. And it did that for all the packages somewhere referenced anywhere in your tree. Um, and that meant it scaled badly, right? So I guess you have more talks on uh, how to scale stuff. This is an example of what scales badly. So Composer basically became victim of its own success. So I don't know how long you've been around, but 10 years ago, <laughs> I think the first commit of Composer was April 2011. And then there was this framework interoperability group, FIG, uh, with PSR zero and all these discussions about autoloading and stuff. So the world we live in today is actually <laughs> very good for PHP. So 10 years ago, this was not uh, the case. And um, basically, Composer wasn't, was just not built for that many releases to happen, right? So the complexity grew with every release. So every time you tagged a new version of your package, the whole complexity would increase. And also, the more the communities try to collaborate with each, each other, so I'm fairly sure at some point, somewhere in Neos, some of my code is running, and the other way around, uh, by using Symfony components, for example. And uh, yeah, so the question is now, well done. So you figured it out. Why didn't you solve it in Composer 1? This would have been easier than waiting for Composer 2, right? And the problem is, Composer also provides plugins. 
You might be familiar with that because NEOS has one too. And there are over 1,500 uh, 1, plugins today, and you could uh, hook into you know, the pool. You could provide repositories dynamically. You could basically do anything. And that would have just been a major BC break if we started to change architectural uh, stuff there. So that's why it couldn't happen in Composer 1. Now, straight to Composer 2. So today I'm talking about my story, which means I'm going to leave out a lot of stuff, a lot of optimizations that went into Composer 2. Um, which is a pity, but it's just <laughs> we don't have time to look into all the stuff that was, is better in Composer 2. And there's a lot of stuff. So better protocols. We have parallel file downloads of metadata, of uh, you know, the packages, uh, unzipping the files. So once it's downloaded all your dependencies, it needs to unzip them, right? And that's done in parallel. Um, more complex stuff with the constraints have been improved. And that's all work that was done mostly by Niels and Jordi, the creators of Composer. And they had to do it with PHP 5.3, which is kind of impressive because, you know, parallel stuff with PHP 5.3 is no fun. So, yeah. But the major improvements I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, happened in the dependency resolution process. So where the SAT solver actually resolves the problem and gives you the result of what is compatible to each other. Um, yes, so we're going to look at it a bit more in detail. Now, all of the improvements I'm going to talk about have the same goal. They share it. It's we want to bring these 5.6 million rules down to a manageable number of rules because Otherwise, they're always going to use three and a half gigabytes of RAM, right? And this happened in three key areas. We have the multi-conflict rule. This was released in Composer 2.0. We have the pool builder. That was also released in 2.0. And then we have the pool optimizer. That was released uh, with version 2.2. Uh, yeah, as a Christmas present last Christmas. I gave you my heart. Um, yeah, so let's get straight to the multi-conflict rule. Um, require rules, we've already looked at them. So this is the same example as I showed you initially. So we know how a require rule looks like. So it's uh, this not rule project, and then all the requirements are just or B or C, so all the versions that exist of a single package name are just one statement. And this means as soon as you define a new require rule in your composer JSON, it basically ends up being one clause, one SAT solver rule, which is great. So one more just means one more rule. There's not a lot we can optimize about that, right? Now, there's not just requirement rules, there's also conflicts, as you know. And um, for this example, just does not make a lot of sense. Uh, but just imagine that our pizza margarita would now conflict with mozzarella and fresh basil, but we would still have the same examples, so the same literals, the same versions. And just as a reminder, this is what it looked like for a require rule. And now you could go and say, so, Conflict means not installing, so clearly we just have to negate the literal, right? So it would, like this. it would look like this. So again, either no pizza margarita, or not uh, the mozzarella, or not the version, uh, I mean version 3 of mozzarella, or 3.1 of mozzarella, and so on. But some of you might have already noticed while I was saying it that this cannot work, because it means either not B or not C. So that means one of them is allowed, right? Because it's or. But it's a conflict. We want none of them installed. And so that, unfortunately, doesn't work. Now, conflicts is, are represented in what we call two literal rules, because always two literals. That's what it would look like. So. 
not B, and not C, and not D, and so on. So that means there are as many rules as there are conflict uh, combinations, right? Uh, it's not so good, but you could argue that, you know, in your daily business, you would more frequently use require rules rather than conflicts, right? But there's this con uh, concept of self-referencing conflicts. So have you asked yourselves how does Composer ensure that it only ever installs one version of the same package? So how does it know that if I say Neos flow in version 1 or 101 or 102, how does it ensure that only one ends up being installed, not all of them? Right, conflict. So every version conflicts with every other single version of the same package. For the ones of you uh, familiar with combinatorics, that is called n choose k. That means k in this case is always two, because it's two, a two literal rule. So how many combinations with two, as, I mean when you choose two, are are there in, let's say, we use the, the example we had before, Symphony Console. So let's just assume 500 packages. How many combinations can we do if version 101 conflicts with 102, 103, 104, 105, and so on? So all the combinations, and I did the math for you, that's almost 125,000 rules just for one package. So it's no wonder you end up having 5.6 million rules, right? Because usually we don't just have Symphony Console installed. And that's basically what the multi-conflict rule is all about. Because Nies asked, asked himself, so what can we do about that? What's special? So if the pizza uh, margarita conflicts with toppings mozzarella in version 1, we cannot optimize a lot of stuff because it could conflict with version 1, but not with version 2. So there's not a lot about that we can optimize. However, the self-referencing conflicts, so the same package name, they are special because they always and always conflict with all of the other ones, right? So it, there's no way Symphony Console 1 would not conflict with 2 or 3 or 4. They all always conflict with one another. And there's no exception to that. And Niels actually managed to represent exactly that case with one single rule, which uh, required special handling in the solver, which is also the reason it wasn't done in Composer 1, because it's kind of surgery on the on the heart of Composer. And yeah, that just meant he was able to reduce the 125,000 rules down to just one. And that was obviously a major performance improvement. That was this pull request, uh, yeah, that was merged in November 2019. So on to the second optimization. That is actually a lot easier, I hope, to understand, because the pool builder solved an architectural design issue, first of all. So it separated building the packages or finding all the packages that are relevant, and then building the rules in a second step. That's the first thing it did, and that's uh, relevant for the next uh, slides. And it optimized the problem that it would just load all the Symphony console versions that were ever released to loading just the ones that were referenced somewhere in your dependency tree. So if your root composer JSON contained Symphony console version, let's say, 4.4 LTS or 5.4 LTS or 6, whatever, then there's no need to load any version 2 or any version 3, right? And that's what the pool builder did. Um, and the, for that pull request, it took me ages to build that. But, uh, and there were also lots of foundation work was needed, which was also done by Jordi and Niels. So 
If you ever feel like you want to uh, give something back to them, then please sign up to private packages or you know, sponsor them on GitHub because they do a, an amazing job. We're really, really fortunate in the PHP community to have those two. Um, yeah, and that again meant a massive reduction of packages and thus less rules that were generated, another performance improvement, and that was when I joined <laughs> the party, and that was merged in 2020, in September. Um, yeah, right about when Composer 2 was released. And so Composer 2 was released, and we were way better. So as you can see, we don't have, it's the same uh, project ran uh, with Composer uh, 2. And we end up having like 2.7 million rules and 1.6 gigabytes of RAM, and we came down from one and a half minute to like 40 seconds, which is about 50% reduction of um, you know, resources in all uh, areas. And that was great. That was good. Something to celebrate. Oh, that was a bit quick. So, <laughs> but it's still 1.6 gigabytes of RAM. It's still 40 seconds, and so... Can we have more? I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, but it's this know your audience thing. <laughs> and uh, so I asked myself, what can I do, right? So we now have this pool builder that separates fetching all the packages and building the pool for it. So the pool now contains all the packages that could ever be relevant for the solving process. And then we have a second step where we build the rules for all that for that pool. So I was wondering, is there a way how we can reduce or how we can throw away um, packages in the pool already in order to not even build rules for them, right? And in the PHP world, we are very, very, very lucky. PHP is a great language. PHP is a great ecosystem. So if you ever you know, if you have ever had the problem of finding a package for your problem, try doing that or finding the right one in the JavaScript world as opposed to the PHP world. I'm telling you it's a lot easier in the PHP world, but you already know that. And um, we just have a lot of packages that are very well maintained, meaning that they get a lot of new versions tagged, right? And I noticed that most of them it's bug fix releases, right? They fix bugs in the code, but they do not have any different composer JSON definition. They still have the same requirements. They do not define new conflicts. Most of them are identical. So I thought there must be a way in which we can, you know, throw away the ones that are identical and just pick the one we need early on in order to reduce the number of rules that are then built. And so I set out to do that, and I failed, I failed again, I did not sleep another night, and so on. And there's a major problem with that. So let's imagine three, we had three different uh, pizza. So we had margarita, we had gamberetti, and quattro stagioni. <laughs> so right now you're hungry, I know that. Um, and just imagine that one of them requires the toppings mozzarella in any version 3. One wants the carrot 3.1, so that means at least 3.1, but not higher than 4, right? Or lower than 4. And one wants the toppings mozzarella in at least 3.2. Now, if you imagine hello, that we had a pool where we had a few, we just imagine a few version 3s, uh, of the toppings mozzarella package. So the goal would be to, you know, say, well, if we run composer update normally, we want to keep the highest one. And if we do prefer lowest, we want to keep the lowest one. So let's just keep 331. And if you run it with prefer lowest, then let's just keep version 3. However, that doesn't work because one of the dependencies wants 3.1 at least. So if we just keep 3.0, this would result in an unresolvable set of dependencies in this beautiful error you've all seen 
many times, right? So it's not as easy as just picking the lowest one or the highest one, because nothing in Composer is ever easy, so obviously it couldn't work. And so I tried to think of a solution for that, and I came up with dependency groups. Now, what I did is I just, now that we have a pool that contains all the packages, we can analyze that pool, so I could loop over all the packages, and I could find out what packages require toppings mozzarella and in what version constraint, right? So I could do this. I could loop over them and just assign the versions to the different groups, right? So which version matches what constraint? And then what we do is we filter within those groups, right? So in the regular case, when you do composer update, this means we can filter in this group and we pick 331. In this group, we filter 331. In this group, we filter 331. So what this translates to is we have to keep one package and all the other packages can go away because they will never be used. So that is one problem, but we've already seen that this is easy in the regular composer update case. But with the prefer lowest, what would happen now, as we only filter within these groups, we have to keep 300. We have to keep 31, and we have to keep 32. And that way the problem is solved. It means we need to keep three packages instead of just one. But hey, we can still throw away a lot of other packages, right? And it's a lot more complex than that because, again, it's Composer. So, um, you know, there are aliases which you might use. You might be familiar with the replace notation. There are also provides and there are conflicts. And there's a lot of stuff which doesn't really matter for this talk. The main thing is we managed to pull it off. And uh, yeah, this got merged in November last year after writing tons of tests and having a lot of support by Jordi and Niels, which I'm very, very grateful for. But uh, this pool optimizer is able to filter out over 80% of all the packages that made it into your pool. And so we end up with Composer today. Um, just as a reference, this was the initial slide, Composer 1, 90 seconds, 3.5 gigabytes of RAM, same project. And this is the new line you would get if you run it now, if you run the latest 2.2 or 2.3, which was released. Um, and you can see that in this case, the pool optimizer was able to filter out 83% of all the packages, meaning we are down from uh, 34,000 initially to just 2.8, 2,800, and we were able to reduce the 5.6 million rules to a ridiculous amount of 82,000. And that's like, yeah, reduction by, I don't know, 89% or something. And so we don't use 3.5 gigabytes of RAM anymore. We just use 175 megabytes. So it's ridiculous. And also, we were able to reduce the runtime of one and a half minutes to just 10 seconds. And <laughs> and um, another number you might not know, but Jordi told me that he has some statistics on it. So every time you run a Composer update on your very laptop, or whatever, on your machine, you are one of three million this day. Three million Composer updates. Sure, there's CI, it's probably not all human. I would be astonished if it was, but it's a lot. It's a lot of Composer updates, and by reducing the amount of resources it uses, um, we can just, you know, it's good for the planet and makes me very proud. So that's uh, one thing where we can probably improve the the planet or when, where we can help for those that were <laughs> here in the previous talk. Yeah, and that's about the story I have to share.
And uh, just uh, I asked Jordi if he would send me some stickers, so if you want a composer <laughs> sticker, <laughs> come get one. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yannick, and uh, thank you for reducing carbon emissions and <laughs> everything you did. I mean it in earnest. It's, yeah, it's not just me, right? It's an open source project. But That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my first and most important question is, which uh, uh, pizza package do you like to install best? Personally? Yeah. <laughs> ah, so many. I guess I would go with the Quattro Staccioni, which is why it was up on the slide. Uh. But I also like... Yeah, Gambaretti is fine too. Ah, any. Pizza right. is always good. Yeah, you're right. No, very good. Very understandable. You made a very complex topic into... Uh, that's why I liked your blog post so, so much as well, because it's very uh, understandable for everyone. Thank you. No, perfect. We have a question. Yes. We? we have a question. Does Wildcard require lead to lead loading all the available versions? It does, yes. That's why you should never use a wildcard. Yeah. Also for other reasons. It's dangerous. Don't do it if you can. But yeah, it really depends on what exactly you are requiring, right? If you do that on a platform requirement, for example, there's only your plat you, you only have one version, the one that's installed, right? So if you do the, the star requirement or whatever this is called, then it's only one that's loaded because there is only one. But if you do that on Symfony console, it will still load everything into uh, RAM. Yes. It will optimize a lot. The pool optimizer will optimize a lot, but it will have to do a lot of work. Yeah. And okay. they're coming in, the questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> How long did the journey take in total? In total? I mean, the amount of work or the journey in like my... So it took off a lot of years of my personal life. I mean, I, I think I will die early because of this. <laughs> no, I hope not. No, I uh, started, as I said, in 2014, around that time. And then I met Jordi and Niels on conferences, and uh, I kind of had a lot of support along the way. So they were very open. They answered my stupid questions over the time until I got familiar with the internals. And uh, I don't know, work time, weeks, I don't know. Okay. A lot. It's just, yeah, just what you put in. I mean, took many attempts. To it. I just showed the, the end product now, but it took many attempts because, as I say, I failed. It's not like I just sat down and knew what to do. Do you I have, have any, no idea. Any like other hobbies where we can expect performance mm. improvements in the future? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking for one. We'll see. No. <laughs> right now I don't. And we have still have some questions. Where does it go from here? What are the next updates? Ooh, I don't know. It's an open source project. It's whatever you make it. <laughs> but I think in terms of dependency resolution, there's not a lot we can do anymore. But there's probably a more parallel stuff that, that can be done, I don't know, or just some pre-calculation stuff. Like, yeah, maybe if you happen to resolve the same things for the same projects over and over again, maybe, you know, there's some resource bundling that could happen there. But it's also dangerous, so mm, not sure there's a lot of stuff we can optimize. But I'm sure somebody will find something. And the last question, mm -hmm. when, Composer, when Composer 1 gets shut down? That I don't know. I'm not one of the maintainers. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's whenever Jordi and Niels feel like. I, I know that they have to maintain the old packages uh, stuff still. Um, packages.org, as I said, there are two protocols, and they still have to run the old one. And that has a big impact on. Uh, the ecosystem, so still a lot of load there, but I don't know, that's up to them. So maybe for the next talk, you will have to invite Jordi again on this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's from the audience. Very good, thank you. If, if we miss some questions because we uh, have to uh, reload the page uh, over time, just uh, shout out and we're gonna look at it again. 
I know we missed an interesting question from last talk, so you can go to Stefan and ask him. For now, thank you, Yannick. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. very much for this very interesting talk. Thank you for having me. Have Perfect. a nice and trip. We, to we still have also a present for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I forgot. Uh, this is, again, a bottle of gin for your journey to Potsdam. Thank you very much. I will try not to drink. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.